when the mayor of New York, La Guardia, uh, retired after four or five hundred years, Time Life introduced him um, to the and thanked him for everything he did for New York. But then the interviewer said, but Mr. Um, La Guardia, you've always made big mistakes as well. And he said, my boy, when I make a mistake, it's a beaut. Now, the the project I'm going to describe failed, but I do think that the approach um, and the pro forma approach was something worth listening to. This is a picture of the Kilombero Valley and those spectacular trees you see in the background are Sterculios, um, which doesn't have much use because the wood is too soft. But in this case, uh, they were left particularly because at, at the base of each, uh, there is a grave. So these are living monuments to, to, uh, to the dead. Now, let's get um, orientated. Dar es Salaam to the top right of your screen, Moro Goro, a little at next arrow. That's where the government in exile um, lived. The compound is still there. And so the, the Utsungwa Mountains on the left, we had a spectacular talk about them early on in this series. It's one of the super centers of, of biodiversity in Africa. There, it is truly spectacular. And then just below that, that lies the Kilombero Valley. So you can see it lies pressed between the Utsungwas and the Sulu Game Reserve. The town of Morogoro has behind it a spectacular mountain called Uluguru, which is a world heritage site. But at the present moment, the cut line for charcoal runs under these cliffs. It has been completely denuded. There is hardly anything left on it. It was one of great, great tragedies. Moving from Morogoro, you, you go through the Mkumi game reserve, which is extraordinary in that most of their animals are subsized. They are, they are inevitably smaller than the adjoining Sulu. And uh, we, we simply have no idea why this is. So, we look in a bit more uh, geographic detail. Here you can see the town that uh, is our, our base called Ifakara. On the Richter scale of hell holes, this is an 8.2. Um, it is the, the epicenter of malaria in the world. Uh, the Swiss Tropical Institute has their, their research station. And this beautiful thing here is the is the Kilombero Valley, um, in which this extraordinary wetland lies, which holds 80% of the world's leshware. It is fabulously biodiverse. And, um, and, and certainly one of the forgotten places of Africa, because the, the road ends there, you, you simply can't. Um, so even more detail, you can see the extent of the, um, of the wetland with Ifakara here and over, over the Kilombero River, a ferry, which is one of the most dangerous ferries in the entire universe. So looking down on, on this uh, image, you can see the cut line at the base of the Utsungwa Mountains. This is the, this is the border of the World Heritage Site. And as one can expect that adjoining this, Every single piece of land has been denuded because of one thing, because of roads. I hold to this day that over and above the five big impacts on, uh, you know, the big five, habitat destruction, etc., one should add one called roads because the minute you make a road into any area, things can be brought in and things can be taken out. And here lies the Utsungwas. It is conceivably one of the richest areas in Africa, but you can see that it is completely cut off from the rest of the landscape by this cut line of agriculture. So it has effectively become an island. That's fine for birds, but if you are, if you are a, a primate, you are locked in. And much like the gorillas in the in, in Buindi impenetrable forest, complete island. And if you look at the um, at the Rwandan gorillas, more and more they becoming an island species. The town 
which must be familiar to most of you, dust, heat and dust. This is the stuff of great movies and, and novels. E.M. Foster would have written about this town. We were asked to prepare a holding of 100,000 hectares set aside for the growing of Burmese teak. Now, teak has just about been eradicated from the east. There's a little bit left in India, but the rest of the world's teak is now planted six degrees both sides of the equator around the world, and it grows exceptionally well. We ran into why we tried to fix broken forests is because we wanted to overcompensate on principle 10 of the FSC um, principle, indicators and principle, which said thou shalt not convert <laughs> um, existing forests. And we wanted to do that. So we capped the planting to 7,000 hectares out of the 100,000 and said the 90 odd plus hectares we will now um, manage as a conservation area. Looking at this picture of the dark continent, uh, you can see my room light down here. And um, perhaps I, I think the other little thing is perhaps Brian, um, the oil flares of Nigeria. But in the normal light spectrum, of course, Africa is still relatively unpopulated compared to Europe. But then if you look um, at the infrared, this happens that you can see the, the swathe of artificial light, uh, now a bit more visible, uh, Johannesburg and so on. But the rest of Africa, a third of it burns annually. Every, this is the clump data for one year's fires in, um, in Africa. And of course, it actually, the footprint lies exactly over the Miombo biome. Uh, this is just a, uh, to give you an idea of the number of fires per annum, uh, this is from NASA, um, where uh, it is widespread and um, institutionalized. Miombo, as most of you will know, is a wooded grassland um, dominated completely by two species, Brachystegia and Jolbonedia. Um, but th these are the major crown closing species, but for the rest, it is beautifully biodiverse as well. Here we can see the two areas in which we planted. That's Ifakara, that's a road. And you can see these little green plantings are, and over here is part of our uh, planting of teak. Now, <clears throat> looking at the foothills of the, of the uh, Utsungwas, teak, is never planted in a linear fashion, simply because it is perfectly matched to soil type. So you can see soil was mapped here, and which gives it a rather informal and um, sort of ad hoc outline, which is very good in terms of biodiversity, because you don't want square blocks in a landscape as beautiful as this. Fringing the uh, Miombo are evergreen forests. Um, Utterly divine, divine forest, brim full of lion, elephant, buffalo, lesh, where you name it, it's there. And um, in a previous talk, I just, this is my driver, JJ, who, ref this is lunchtime. He refuses to get off the roof of the vehicle because there are a great number of buffaloes with broken arrows in their backsides, uh, not too happy to see you. Um, so I would have my sandwich uh, and he would urinate straight past me, um, refusing to get down. The, uh, it, it's high rainfall area uh, with beautiful, utterly beautiful streams. And here I took a great chance and I, I, I transposed the South African standard system, the SAS water system, and adapted it to the um, uh, Tanzanian conditions. And it works spectacularly well. And just by the way, on the first day we found a crustacean and a little fish new to science. It's been very poorly sampled. Here, JJ is now quite happy we're away from the um, lions and collecting uh, samples. As a naturalist, um, I find it difficult to sleep 
in this area. It is truly, utterly, truly wonderful. The, this is one of the foam frogs. It looks like a friend of mine, a um, bit gloomy. Um, and um, th the minute you turn around, there are orchids I couldn't possibly key out. Uh, uh, more than likely new species. On the forest floors, there are these glowing, glowing, beautiful plants broadcasting their presence in bandwidth that is visible in the gloom of the forest floor. And just by the way, and I think it might be completely ridiculous, but Bertie and I, my friend, think that the seed might imitate a, a tick on an open wound, which would then get um, insectivorous birds to eat a frugivorous diet and so spread the seeds. Um, truly wonderful things. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, abundance of fungi uh, is truly breathtaking. Um, uh, colors that you would expect in Studio 54 in New York. Um, it's a huge activity of grass cutting termites. The, um, the most spectacular insects I've ever seen in my life. Um, this is the, uh, uh, we find them down here on Morning Glory, but the next picture, I suspected that someone gave a child with crayons some alcohol and asked him to color in um, this utterly divine, it's called the Picasso beetle. Um, I wouldn't believe it until I took the picture and the damn thing flew off. I was completely gobsmacked. That is, um, it, it's, this is not a, 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 um, a, a, a Woolworths banana. It's about half the size, I would think, but this is the largest bloody caterpillar I've ever, I could hear the thing coming. We were having lunch when this thing walked up and obviously fairly poisonous with all those spikes on and spines on it. Um, but every moment in the Quilombero is a surprise. Um, it is stuffed with roan. Um, you, you, you can't go a kilometer without meeting roan. Now, the reason we are here is teak. Teak um, is in huge demand around the world for luxury applications, which means that it's used for decks in super yachts, um, flooring in very high quality kitchens. All of the stuff goes to Central Park in New York. It is a, it is a truly spectacular wood. It's rot resistance. Um, it smells nice. It's really wonderful. So when we first arrived, this is um, uh, on the plains, rolling plains, where an area had now been prepared for planting teak. Now, you know, it, it's tragic uh, in a sense that um, conversion did occur of, of pristine, fairly pristine miombo. But on the other hand, I will explain later why we allowed it. One of the reasons why this vegetation type is so enormously valuable is because of this tree. This is um, Dalbergia melanoxlon, African blackwood or African ivory wood. It is currently the most expensive wood in the world. It's used mainly for musical instruments and a blank for, a, um, for something like a recorder will cost you $10,000. That's what you pay for a blank, that not for the instrument, for the blank. When we arrived here, of course, we could see that there was a hell of a lot of wood that they, they pushed into heaps and burnt. Um, secondly, they left the Dalbergia standing and we had an iffy fit because um, we know for a fact the growth speed um, of of teak is so high that within four or five years, it would simply kill that tree. So we said, take the damn thing out and sell it. And secondly, all this wood lying around should be given to the community into in which footprint this conversion has occurred. And that was agreed upon. One of the classic Af problems of Africa, of course, is patch burning. We know for a fact, if you know, anywhere in Uganda, if you sit at night, it looks as if you're sitting in a war zone with all the patch burning going on. So a patch would be cleared, the bigger trees ring barked, um, giving a little bit of shade to the crop, which is, you know, manioc or, or sweet potatoes or cassava. 
But this is one of the greatest problems we have to do with, deal, deal with. Animal trapping is rampant snaring. There is actually a refinement here in that um, certain snares are specifically aimed at specific animals. This is a leshware um, snare. It occurred to me that night in my tent, which had a, a satellite phone in it, that I possibly have seen this before. And I went to my pictures of Namibia, um, of uh, practically all, all over Africa. And within the last 10 years, every single criminal, uh, if I might call them that, has changed to blue string. It's the most beautiful evolutionary example uh, that happened independently because now we know, of course, that antelope cannot see well into the blue spectrum. And quite independently, uh, thousands of kilometers apart, people realize that if you use blue string, then you can, of course, catch more animals. But the, the lesson here was that because these uh, um, snares are plotted, I asked for the plots, and of course, the game rangers could tell for which snare it was. And within a minute, out of the GIS map, leapt all the routes instantly of where animals moved. We knew instantly where the buffalo moved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So with all this attrition, there was actually a very good lesson to be learned. <clears throat> Life in this valley is subsistence, and people eke out a most appalling living. This man had spent his entire day, first of all, he cycled to wherever he could find wood, and then this load would be worth about four or five rand. That's his day's work, and he had to push his bicycle 20 kilometers back. Now, this is a tip for you, prospective academics. <clears throat> there are two kinds of students that you take on a field trip, the best and the worst. This one is the best. Um, Arnel Blichnot, one of my students, uh, the, the gloomy look had to do with a puff adder that I had to chase away from the spot she was standing on. But here she stands at a Delbergia that had been cut. You can see that for the simple reason that it had a beehive in the top of the tree. So if you look at that log, it would be worth in the order of perhaps $40,000, $20, 000, between $20,000 and $30,000 left to rot because there was a beehive. And this is the tragedy of the commons, that the, the poor inhabitants have no idea of the value of the, the, the enormously rich area that they're living in. And, um, and in this case, the tree was simply set alight to get to the honey um, in the top of it. They, they are burning through utter fortunes in, in a desperate attempt to survive. The, the carving ability of this wood is truly spectacular. You can carve it to an eggshell thickness. This is a, I shouldn't have bought it because I'm you know, part of the problem, but I simply couldn't resist just this utterly magnificent fruit bowl. Piracy is rife. This is a camp of a pirate we found. Now, the heap of Dalbergia lying behind Arnel here, happy since it has no puff adders in it, um, would be a few hundred thousand dollars um, that, that is um, illegally exported. Mainly, I'll have you know, through Durban. All of this wood, there's a syndicate in Durban, which we can't crack because they're incredibly dangerous. They, they threaten your life. Um, and so we could um, at least save this lot of wood. <clears throat> it's usually cut. You can see there was a setsy there, usually cut in pit saws, which is enormously wasteful because of the, the width of the, uh, the uh, blade and the resulting waste. Dalbergia, because of its enormous thermal quality, is also sold as firewood uh, for a pittance. Now, you know, a, a great number of musical instruments could have been made from this heap next to the road, but alas, again, the population didn't know this. So let's start with fixing broken forests. We were tasked um, to see what we can do to soften the blow of Principle 10 of the FSC. FSC says you shall not convert. You shall never convert. But we said that 
because of the tiny amount of, of land we were going to use in in the production of high quality wood, we would then the 90,000 odd hectare. So off we went, Anel and I and JJ, and had a look at what a pristine Miombo forest, the, the one on the right tending towards evergreen. Um, most of you will know, Rod, you will know that the minute you have a climber, any climbing plant, then it tends to be evergreen. Uh, climbers hardly ever uh, grow in dry Miombo. So we had a look at that. We had community meetings, extensive community meetings, um, intergroups, uh, medicine, uh, you know, health, education, uh, feeding, etc. We fully informed, we fully informed the community what we were going to do and what they would, the benefits that they would reap from it guaranteed by contract. Um, and it was one of the most gentle things I've ever done, the, the sheer gratitude of people. We then went into the field. You can see behind here is a young stand of, um, of teak, just uh, about two years old. And so we took the entire community into the field and showed them exactly what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, how we were going to stop fires, etc. In the meantime, Anel and I were interested in the usable um, and, and, and selected species of Miombo that were obviously cut out because they had value. So um, over a matter of about 10 days, we visited every single wood merchant. You can see a bed is being made in the background um, where we interviewed them with a very simple questionnaire. Oh, this uh, just by the way, there was a at the beginning of the AIDS pandemic, there was a huge demand on wood and it was so the demand was so high that the locals started cutting down their mango trees in order to bury the dead, which was truly tragic because they were simply cutting up future crops. They make beautiful artifacts. This boat weighs a bloody ton, but um, it's made from very hardy wood and would never really go down. So th th this is what a company questionnaire looked like. What was your main business? Which timber do you? And of course, the, the Kiswahili, Ninga, Mbuli, Mungazi. Why do you use it? Which timber is your favorite? Why? If you can choose an indigenous timber, which one would you choose? And you can see there's already coming out Meninga, Meninga, Meninga. Um, and what is the source of your timber? Timber dealers and individual for individuals for specific kinds of wood. So off we went back into the felt, and now we are in denuded, um, heavily abused Miombo. And the reason we wanted to be here was to look at nearest distance. So we had to have an idea of what does the architecture look like of a forest that is pristine compared to a forest that has been heavily utilized. So we could get a very good idea. And I think it's one of the fairly easy way without doing a Braun Blanque before, for instance, you know, which is much more detail, but just looking at species and nearest distance of the neighbor. We visited the local um, nurseries in order to find the sources of the plants we wanted, see if they had the capacity like that. And to our own nursery, the, the, these are cuttings for teak and we wanted to gear them up to produce the selected species. This gives you an idea of the truly magnificent wood that Miombo can produce. Uh, this is the, this is Delbergia, the super expensive one. I am actually quite relieved that the world hasn't discovered the, 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 the sheer beauty of these woods because the pressure would instantly be on these forests. So keep it mum between us. I took off to Morogoro to go and see Dr. Singer, one of the preeminent African botanists. Uh, he's a forest botanist. And before I saw him, I did a li literature survey, knowing nothing about Miombo, knowing nothing about the species. And by simply looking at their main uses, selected a number of species. And the scientific method works because of the seven species that I selected, he threw out one. And I had 
absolutely no idea what I was doing. I was simply going on the science. And so here is a list of the six species that we decided to um, use in enrichment planting. Now we had a, a good grip on, uh, on the data by knowing exactly how far these things are apart. Um, and here comes the here comes the, the problem. So we laid out experimental plots, both sides of the river. Um, and although it looks rather small, uh, it's highly complex because the planting of this was truly randomized. So this is a four by four meter planting, and this is a two by two meter planting, obviously doubling the number of plots. But then within these plots, we randomized by computer the number of treatments we wanted to test. Five-year burn, high density, five-year burn, low density, five-year burn, no planting. So we, we really took a lot of time to cover the basis of the variables that one could actually test in an experiment like this. Um, and so this is Nakafulu, this is the experimental plot number two at Nakafulu, and this is Ichima. Um, uh, let's just gloat over this because I think that um, it's not really important. It's the principle here that counts. So on, in my first talk, I covered this, but perhaps there are some people that haven't heard it. And, and this is simply a little object lesson. I had great trouble in motivating the workforce to do what what the Mzungu wanted them to do. You know, this is the great problem of Abbott. The, the Mzungu st stands under an umbrella and shouts at the workers. And on day four, I decided to join them. The reaction in the workforce was electrifying because I was digging holes, I was working as hard as they were. And it, it, you know, it sounds like sort of soft psychology, but it's not. It is showing true willingness, it is showing commitment. And once you have won the hearts of illiterate people, then the, the, the battle is just about over. And so here we had our first plot. You can see in the background, it's fairly denuded. But now if you think back of the number of treatments we had, each seedling had to be planted in a very specific spot. It, it could not be moved. And how on earth do you tell illiterate people how what to put in hole number 59 in plot 72? And this caused a huge problem. I'll come back to that now. The second thing we did, all the trees we were going to plant into the Miambo, we hardened off. We simply put them out in the bright sunlight straight from the nursery. And instead of daily watering for the first week, we watered them every second day and then every third day. So you have to harden the plants um, in order to have planting success. An inordinate time was spent on the whole preparation, planting techniques, how to deal with roots that had swung in order to optimize the results of our experiment. And here the big day arrived, lorries full of trees that now had to be planted into the denuded Neonbo. And Anel and I uh, spent hours carrying little uh, trees to their correct spots so they could be planted, but it took so much time and then suddenly the idea came. We color coded every species. Uh, we had bamboo stakes and Ninga was red, Mvule was blue. And within seconds, every, all we had to do is walk with the master plan and drop a, um, a colored marker next to each tree. And suddenly it worked extremely well. Now, this is it. Very soon after we, we completed the experiment, the company was sold. Now, isn't this the story of our lives, you know, that the minute you, you think you have a grip of, on things, then suddenly everything changes and the new management was not interested in enrichment planting because they already had the FSE certificate and they were actually obliged to follow that. But um, from 
from this failed experiment, I think we can take a few lessons. One, the first most important lesson is that broken forests can be fixed to a point where they have the structural integrity of the original. They will never, ever have the same biodiversity indices for very simple reasons. The second point is that we instituted, and this is actually still being um, adhered to, that the felt should be burnt every three years and not annually. The reason for that is fairly simple because all, most of the species, most species on earth have a mycorrhizal association which um, enhances tree growth. We know that. Um, so this constant burning impacts highly on mycorrhizal activity and um, I can farewell predict that once you, sh once you shift from a three to a five year burning cycle, you will have gobsmacking and dramatic results in growth simply because the fire, um, the effect of fire. The, the, the fourth point is that one has to remember that a tiny plant that had either been planted or had naturally germinated needs to grow to a certain height, what it's known as escape height, where a fire doesn't kill it. Usually, uh, Miombo is fire adapted, so the big trees don't suffer at all, but it's the little ones that, uh, that get knocked out every year by annual burning. This annual burning is driven by poverty. It's not driven by anything else. It's by poverty where you need, first of all, to be safe. You burn an area, then the lion can't jump on you. Secondly, it enhances the quality of the fodder for your cattle. So, um, let us let us take questions. I want to thank you for listening to me. The the Kilumbero Valley is uh, there are two places I dream of when I dream. And the one is Iceland for its sheer barren beauty. But when I'm really in heaven, I dream of Miombo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave, for the talk. I'm sure we'll, we'll have a good conversation about this sometime in the next week. Um, I'm interested to know, um, with all the, all the birds, are you seeing uh, vegetation species composition shifts? So to, to species that are more fire adapted, uh, smaller legumes, for instance, uh, more annual grasses, annual daisies, uh, Obviously, I have no idea of the vegetation composition up there, but are you seeing uh, a vegetation shift and not just a, a loss of species? Absolutely. Um, I haven't done that, but to the to my untrained eye, I mean, if I'd known about your little passion, sorry, if I'd known about your passion for um, for your your species, I would have looked out for them. Um, what what happens with annual burns is simply this that across this entire area, for very many thousands of square kilometers, plants become pedestaled. Only the roots hold a little bit of... So if you look at it just um, with, your, with your drone, it looks magnificent. There's grass cover, but if you open the grass, you will find that every single plant, not only grasses, are pedestaled. They hold that tiny little cone of, of grass. So there is a massive loss of topsoil, massive. You only need to look at the Zambezi in flood and you will find, um, I forgot to put that in, but the, the current delta of mud in the Indian Ocean from the um, Zambezi is 200 square kilometers. No coral, it's just mud. And it all comes from this damn annual burning. There are no buffers. The runoff is supreme. So you as a botanist would e instantly recognize that some species that are very shallow rooted, you know, and are tied to high um, uh, carbon or, you know, uh, what's the word? Um, compost levels um, will simply not survive, you know. And, and, and if, they, if they're not spread like a dandelion, They've had it, you know, and, and, and so it, it would be extraordinary to, uh, to drag you up there and, 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 and do a transect from pristine through converted to completely converted. And, and, and you would tend to one pull out another PhD. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Brian. 
Uh, Dr. Cheryl, I think you were waving your hand there. I'm asking you to unmute. Hi, uh, Dave. I would like to thank you very much. Um, you show so much passion. And I think this is years of experience is what we saw tonight. And I think my students can only witness what is actually happening. And I would like to say thank you because every single tree makes a difference and it's a life. And I would like to say thank you for going the extra mile for conservation and for saving the forests. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. It's, um, it's actually quite simple. In my first talk, I have this sort of rather cockeyed idea that um, how, does one, how does one conserve the world? Uh, you and I are constantly in the grips of helplessness because, you know, what can I do against the, the, the effluvia of India or China or the United States? But what we can do, we can form a very stable island by making a personal choice to change. Then I talk to my neighbor and perhaps he will change too. And he will talk to his cousin and three towns away. And slowly the landscape is being populated by tiny little dots of, of stability. And if enough people think it, these clump together and they form islands and they will form continents if we suffer enough. We, and I am sorry to say we have not suffered enough. Nature has not hit us hard enough to change fundamentally. Brilliant. Dave, thank you very much, Dr. Cheryl. Thank you, Dave. Dave, I'm going to ask a question here from the chat a section from Lindsay McDonald. It seems the biggest threat to the Miombo in Southern Africa, particularly Zambia and Malawi, is illegal charcoal. People say it's uh, poverty and that there is no alternative, but others say that if charcoal weren't available, people would adapt and find alternative heat, cooking or light sources. What's your answer or opinion then? I, I specifically left this out of the slideshow because I would have had a hot flush. Um, it is insidious. It is actually quite interesting if you look at the, the, the nation states of Africa that they change fundamentally in their choice of energy. There are nations that only use paraffin, but large swathes of Africa use charcoal. So I've consulted, and I, I say this choking, uh, with the tobacco companies, which use, of course, a very precious hardwood to flu cure the, um, um, the tobacco leaves. Uh, Malawi has been, its guts has been rip, uh, ripped out by the loss of, of trees to charcoal. If you look at Morogoro, the third or fourth slide, the cut line for um, Dar es Salaam is now Morogoro. 200 kilometers of nothing, of bananas, of course, and, and other things, but every single tree has been ripped out. So the answer is to immediately start by looking at alternative fast growing exotics and specifically many uh, species of, of bamboo. They grow four meters a, a year, uh, they can be used for buildings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We know skyscrapers can be built with um, bamboo, but it's a fundamental shift then to convince the local that bamboo charcoal is as effective as uh, woodland species. I, a student of mine, did a master's on the the excessive exploitation of acacia areoloba from Namibia. Now we know that that hundreds and uh, thousands of trucks per annum come into the country dragging precious wood from Namibia for us to bry uh, unspeakable things on. And what we did just to test this perception was to at a selected, and we told them about it, a selected power, uh, petrol station, we had a pile of, um, of Acacia areoloba, and then we took roycrons and used food coloring to paint them so that they looked like um, like uh, the real thing. Nobody ever raised them. It sold like it sold out. Um, so it's perception, and we have to change perceptions. And the second thing we have to do, sorry, it's a long answer. We have to look at the 
at the huge variety of available cooking stoves that concentrates the heat because most of this stuff is cooked over an open fire where the loss of, of um, combusting uh, material is in the order of 70%. You can use 70% less if you put it in a proper container. Um, and this can be uh, a motor car rim. It can be a drain pipe. There are many, many dozens of different. So first of all, perceptions need to be changed and alternatives given. It's not going to stop on its own. The short answers here. Lovely, thank you, Dave. And thank you, Lindsay. Um, Justine Eisenhinken uh, is asking, um, I can't speak, but I want to know what's happened to the forest now. I don't know, actually. I, I, I haven't been back. I would kill to get back. Um, and we can't get much um, uh, information from the current owners. I, I, I suspect they might not be interested. Um, but uh, chances are very good that these experiments are still standing because of the teams we employed. We had pep talks to them. And, and they said, why do we plant these little trees? It means nothing. And the answer is, you are planting it for your children. And then, you know, it becomes, and it's, oh, of course, they said we forgot about the children. Um, and it's that kind of very simple approach one can use to, to actually impress upon them the, the importance. The second thing that is most very, we have an enormous problem with fires because there's so many bees in the forests. And if you live in Ifakara and you have to take the ferry um, over the river to get to the fire, by the time you get there, the whole bloody valley is in flames. Answer, fairly simple. For each region, there were four of them, two in Ichima, two in Ifa Ifakara. We gave an annual kitty of, I can't remember, but it was something like $5,000. We said, if there are no fires in your area, the $5,000 can be used for a school. But for every fire, we will subtract $50. <laughs> and overnight, there were no fires. There were absolutely no fires. If there were, they put them out immediately, keeping in mind that there was a big reward. And it saved the company hundreds of thousands of dollars. It, 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 I am of the firm conviction there is no problem in ecology that cannot be mitigated away. Our answer lies in mitigation. We, if you do that, we will do this. And, 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 and make it perfectly clear that it's not bullshit that we are going to do it and do it. Mitigation, you can, you can transform society and you can transform uh, vegetation types. Thank you, Dave. Um, Roland, um, the team behind the scenes tells me that you have a question. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Um, I think I'm unmuted, am I not? There we go. Yes, yes, please, please, please. Yeah. Um, I pick up the Dave on your issue with roads. It's it's very interesting as um, I run a small um, community forest project in West Tanzania on the pretty much on the shores of Lake Tanganyika. And we have styled it as narrow gauge conservation. And by that, I mean that we've actively discouraged roads into the area precisely because of what they bring. And our main worry would be loggers and actually small artisanal mining people as well. And actually restricting our ranges to bicycles. Also stealth really helps. There's no noise of an engine as they approach. And also, if you do, as a small project like us, invest in a vehicle, you will find that you have fifty, sixty thousand dollars embedded in one machine that can be easily destroyed in one accident. Um, so I really get your issue about the road. Of course, we can't fight development as it rolls out, but it's a critical thing to understand where you fight your battles on conservation. And looking at roads rolling across the countryside of West Tanzania, as I do. I decide where and where we're best to deploy our ranges and where we're not, where it's already a lost cause. So I really took that on, on board actually, um, the, the road issue. And I have one technical question. In, in your Miomba, Pterocarpus angolensis, which we would call Meninga in West Tanzania, was that quite common in the Miombo around you? 
Uh, in the Kilimbero, very common, very common. Uh -huh. But a, 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 in a band of 15 kilometers around the wetlands, Luto, it's just gone. Of um, course, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and our enumerations for getting nearest neighbor distance was done very far from the, from the roads, just to get away mm -hmm. from the introduced effect of them. And, yeah. um, we, you know, we, we've seen it all my life. You find the most spectacular area, you put a road into it, and it simply goes. Mm. Um, yeah. I nearly said with my far, father years, but it goes backwards very quickly. Yeah. yeah. No, understood. Very um, and, and, this, uh, and once it's in, you can't take it out. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was a very inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Dave. Any other questions? I can't see any hands up at the moment. Oh, there we go. Peter de Vol, Mart, uh, where is Peter now? Marty, your hand was up. I can't see Peter. Um, Marty, I'm going to ask you. Yes, there we go. You Hi, are Dave. <laughs> Thanks very much for the very interesting talk. I'm just sort of interested in the whole, um, what is sustainable? harvesting and what is legal logging and what is illegal logging and I sometimes get the sense that when it's a um, you know more established company somehow it, be, it, it seems to be legal but I mean is there any actually legal logging allowed of these of these um, hardwoods African hardwoods? In order to do legal logging of any resource, <clears throat> you need to have a national standard. And this, as far as I know, has not been written uh, for Tanzania. Um, I've been deeply involved in writing the standard for Chile, for instance. And then, of course, you know, what the hell do I know about Notofagus rainforest? I mean, I can put it in a thimble with room to spare. But I know the principles. <laughs> I, I know the signs. Um, well, I think I do. Um, so uh, th there is no current uh, world market for Miombo species. Um, and th that's why I said, I hope it's never discovered because it really holds extremely beautiful wood with very wood good woodworking companies. And the, the idea was when we got involved into this was specifically of sustainable utilization, especially into the closest near nearest neighbor uh, plantings. On a planned basis, you know, that you say after five years, you will remove 15% uh, of the standing volume, uh, according to the to a, to a log of um, of species. Obviously, you're not going to take the Alberge out uh, within 25 years, you know, because then it's only usable, then you can make a flute from it. So each species will have to have its own protocol, I suspect, um, if you want to do it properly. And currently, that isn't in place. I mean, from, from what you <laughs> no, no, I mean, if you look at the continent, it's very much a free for all. Um, you know, and if, if you look at the, the, the erstwhile uh, Nigerian forests, for instance, I mean, there's nothing left. There's no, it looks like Vietnam after Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and if you go to northern, um, if you go to northern Mozambique around Lachinga uh, and Tet, it, it's a wasteland. It's an absolute wasteland. Uh, you cannot believe that that such barrenness can still produce anything of use. And, and is that mainly from the charcoal manufacturing, or is it uh, international charcoal? As yeah. simple as that, charcoal. Charcoal and patch burning to attract game for the poachers. That, of course, is another great magnet. Uh, the I mean, you, from down here, we know that a grey rebuck, I don't know, they, they have extraordinary senses. They will sense a fire 200 kilometres away and a week later they're there. They know, and Eland, you know, they know instinctively there's food coming. And so strategically, specifically on, on, on smaller riverbanks and in the dambos, you know, in the flays, those are burned consistently to attract... Um, to attract game to the snares and the guns. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm always uh, count on you, as Rod said, for a question or two. Uh, Lorraine Chitok, your hand is up. Andrew, I'll get you just after that. 
Lorraine, I'm asking you to unmute. There we go. Hi, um, I'm in Chile um, and I have kind of rewilded a parcel of land that was bulldozed and I learned a lot. Um, unfortunately, I missed half of your talk, so I'll be looking at it on YouTube. Um, I want to relocate back to East Africa within the next six months or so. So I'm looking to come somewhere where I could be involved with something like this. Do you know of, um, you know, do you have any new projects or do you know anyone who does? Not at the moment, but what you can do immediately is um, look at my media on internet, send me an email, it's all there, you'll pick it up very quickly. And I can put you in the cookie jar. Um, I have a, a CV cookie jar. Uh, which region are you working in? I'm, in I'm in Chile right now. I'm, I'm like two hours north of Santiago, but I... Um, oh, you, it, so, so it's a bit drier up there. It's very dry and I'm right on the coast. So I, we're blasted by wind and salt. Oh, it's been yeah. brutal, but it's been a good learning experience too. Just a tip, and just I, a and tip I, for you. And, what we... and I've no, learned, no, carry on. I've, I've learned that, you know, that whole philosophy, oh, you know, you're planting trees for the next generation. No, if you do it right, you, you do it for, in five years as you know it doesn't you take are that completely long. right everybody said to me oh you can't grow dalberga it'll take 200 years you can you can get usable dalberga in 15 years it's as simple as that but just if you should go back to chile something we i worked south of Valdivia, um you know really far south in the notophagus forests but i think it holds true for the area that you're working in is that um, if you do replanting, you must make absolutely sure that you have site adapted plants. If you go to, to, to Valdivia, you will find genetic differences in the single species from valley to valley. So if you get your, your source of replanting from exactly where you're working, rather than a, a nursery from 200 kilometers away, that's a very good thing to remember. Yeah, They're yeah. highly, highly, highly site adapted. And slope adapted, you know, you can't plant a northern slope or the southern slope. It's a, you have to be, it, it's an egg dance. Um, but, but do send me an email and I'll be in contact with you. Well, thank you. Uh, Lorraine, just on that point, I just posted in the chat section, I posted the link to Dave's website. It's davepepler.com, but it's in the, it's in the chat. That's it. Um, Andrew, you Thanks. can do uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute, and if you have any questions. Okay, can can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank yes. You. Okay, thanks very much, Dave, for this presentation. Very informative. Uh, just a quick question. Um, this harvested wood in those forests in Tanzania, and um, I heard that they are used for a number of reasons, furniture and uh, as, um, you know, um, and for other reasons that are charcoal and so forth and so forth. In your mind, do you think they contribute uh, somehow uh, a bit in the economy development of the country, you know, boosting their GDP the short and so forth? The short answer is I don't think so. <clears throat> if it were to be calculated, and if you're working in a highly informal sector, it's extremely difficult to get a group to get data out of it. You know, you can stand next to a road and look at lorries going past. But but again, you can have more than half the wastage of current production techniques by upping it. Uh, in Namibia, for instance, I worked in the north, I certified charcoal in Namibia for export market. The standard way that locals make charcoal, the conversion rate is one to six. You need six tons of tree, of dry wood to get a ton. If you put it in a slightly adapted portable kiln, it goes from one to three. You, you immediately double the output. And 
these poor people haven't got access to a rolling drum because, as you know from Africa, what you do is you dig a hole, you put the wood in it, you cover it with soil, make two breathing holes, set it alight, and then, you know, and then it smolders for a week. You can half production time, you can half the yield, you can double the yield by applying very simple techniques. And, and th this is where the, 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 the spread of destruction and the rate of destruction and the value of the product, uh, destruction can be halved, value can be doubled.